But welcome everybody. Um, my name is Maya Swope. I am the outreach coordinator here at Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. Really excited that you are all here to join us for Boundary Waters Day with REI. Um, I just wanted to start with a shout out to REI, especially some of the folks in the local offices in Minnesota here. They've been really great about partnering with us um, for this event. Um, and hopefully we will see you um, in the store in real life um, for next year's REI Day with the Boundary Waters. Um, they also have donated some $25 gift cards um, as raffle prizes for today. So um, for anyone that stays through the presentation today, um, you'll be entered to win one of those prizes. So look out for an email from me later on this weekend to see if you are a winner with that. Um, I wanted to just give a little bit of a, a background about Friends of the Boundary Waters and then I'll turn it over to Hudson. So um, we have been a nonprofit working to protect the Boundary Waters for over 40 years. We really recognize that the wilderness and the people and the community are all tied together and that kind of it's, it takes all of us to keep the wilderness wild to protect clean water and so that's really at the core of our mission and all of the work that we do. Um, one of the main tenets of what we do is kind of building excitement and building knowledge about the Boundary Waters, which is where our program fits in today. So we're excited that you are all here to, to learn about um, how you can make your, your trip to the Boundary Waters or to any other wilderness area um, that much more enjoyable with the best meals possible. Um, so a few notes about the Zoom call today. We do have a Q&A feature at the bottom, so if you have questions for Hudson, Throughout the event, you can put those in the Q&A. You can also use the chat to share ideas or insights or um, to message me if you have any trouble with the technology. Um, so I think that's all of the housekeeping stuff. Oh, I will turn on, we have a live transcript feature as well. Um, so I just turn that on. If you wanna hide it, you can click, there should be like a closed captioning or a transcript feature at the bottom of your screen that you can click and turn that off um, if you don't wanna see that. Um, I'm excited to introduce Hudson Ledeen, who is our new community coordinator um, based in Ely. So he's a new staff member with Friends of the Boundary Waters Wilderness. Um, he also was a chef and has 12 years of professional cooking experience um, and teaching other folks how to cook. Um, and so really is a great resource when we are talking about meals in the wilderness, kind of the perfect in between of both of those categories. Um, so I'm excited to have Hudson share some of his tips and tricks and insights today. Um, Hudson, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Awesome, um, thank you Maya, I really appreciate it. So as Maya said, I'm the community coordinator for the Friends um, based up here in Ely. Um, today we're gonna talk about cooking tastier meals in the wilderness. So what I wanna focus on with this talk is fundamentals. So the fundamentals for cooking food is way more important than a recipe. It's way more important than most other things you're gonna take away from when it comes to making a great meal. So um, we're gonna talk about execution, the equipment and mise en place, you know, and trip planning. So um, let's go ahead and jump into what I'm talking about when it comes to fundamentals. So execution. This is probably the thing I can say that I worked the hardest with when I was training cooks or even myself is executing a meal, executing a recipe, executing a dish. It's huge. Um, it's gonna lead to a tastier meal regardless of what you're cooking. Um, when we would have a stage come in where it's basically tryouts for an uh, employee to come into a restaurant and see what their skill set is, you're gonna ask them to cook the most basic things because that shows what their foundation is for creating a good meal. Can they fry an egg? You know, can they, you know, pipe icing on a cake? Whatever it is, it's just, it's huge. So what I wanna jump into is talking about knife skills and dice size. So two things that strike me as important when you're out in the wilderness and you're trying to create a good meal is, one, and I get this question a lot, is filleting a fish. You know, how do you properly fillet a fish? And there is an infinite amount of ways to fillet a fish. Maybe not an infinite, but like several ways to fillet a fish, depending on what kind of fish it is, how you want to cook the fish. Um, and we could do a whole segment on that. I'm not going to get into that. I would highly recommend looking up 
um, some YouTube videos. It's always a great source for that. But when it comes to the one tip I could give when it comes to filleting a fish is having a sharp fillet knife and taking your time. You know, I see too many people rush through. They want to show, hey, I've been here before. I know what I'm doing. And you leave a lot of meat on the bone. Versus if you take a little bit more time, you stroke the knife slowly over the ribs, you're going to end up with a nicer fillet, something that's going to cook easier because it's more intact and it'll go a long way. Um, the other thing I want to talk about with knife skills is dice size. Dice size is huge because when you're cutting up a vegetable, and this really pertains to vegetables, you want a uniform shape. Um, a uniform shape is gonna lead to uniform cooking times. So let's say you're, you're cutting up carrots. You know, it's one of my favorite things to bring into the wilderness because they pack well no matter what time of the year is, um, no matter what the temperature is, and you know, who doesn't like a nice carrot? Sauteed, steamed, whatever you're gonna do with it. But what's important is making sure that that dice size is uniform. Because you don't want to have a carrot piece that's one inch by one inch and a carrot piece that's a quarter inch by a quarter inch because that quarter inch is going to be overcooked and mushy and that one inch piece is going to be undercooked and just not, it's not going to create a tasty dish. And the other thing is the visual, you know, the appearance of the dish. You know, we eat with our eyes. I see most people take photos of food before they eat it what the appearance of that dish is goes a long way. So that's just something to, to focus on and take your time. Um, the next thing I wanna jump into here is measurements in the eyeball. I know that sounds super weird, but let me break that down. So when you're going out in the wilderness, you're typically not gonna be bringing measuring cups or measuring spoons, but yet you're, going to be trying to follow a recipe or an idea of what you want to do with this dish and being able to use your eyeball on how to measure that cup of milk or that dash of you know cumin like what does a dash mean you know what is it what does a tablespoon look like when you don't have that measuring spoon um and this is you know this is going to jump down to where i have practice 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 but understanding what your skill set is there, applying it is going to go a long ways for creating a more tasty dish. So that's it's something to really focus on. Devils in the details, something to think about. So jumping into the next thing here, we have is heat and temperature control. This is probably the thing that I see the most with people struggling um, when it comes to cooking. Um, and the reason being is that temperature is huge. I mean, it's not just a, a set it and forget it. It's, there's a nuance to it. And especially when you're cooking over open flame. Um, and I would highly encourage more people, and I always do, cook over coals, cook over a fire. It's the way humans have been eating for a long, long time. Since the first time some person threw a mammoth steak on um, some coals and realize that char really makes this meat taste a lot better. It's it's fun. You're out there in the wilderness. You know why not do it? Um, you know obviously you can be cooking on a burner. You can be cooking on a camp stove. You have canister systems. But you know if you're if we're looking at making a tastier, more fun gourmet experience, cooking over flame is going to go a long ways. The U.S. Forest Service has put out those awesome grates over the fire um use it it's it's fun it's part of the experience and it will make the food taste better so when you're putting together that that fire when you're trying to have the outcome of you know having a tasty meal what you want to do is recognize what fuels to be using what size your fuels should be using and what the coal is going to be so if you're you know trying to have a uh, hot fire base and you really want to sear a steak, for example, you don't want to be cooking with more flashy fuels. You might want to use those to start the fire, like so you're using small balsam um, branches or twigs or whatnot. Those are going to get hot fast, you know, get your fire going, but that coal base isn't going to last and it's also going to throw a lot of brands out in the air that might fall on top of your food. So 
maybe you start your fire with that and then you add some you know smaller birch sticks you know i always when i'm out camping with people you know you never want to burn anything that's larger than the you know diameter of your wrist because it's just going to take too long um but those are those are things that are going to lead up to like a well executed meal um and with that said is the equipment you're using. So, you know, typically someone's bringing out, you know, backpacking um, pots and pans. That's what it's advertised as. It's aluminum or maybe a thin steel and it doesn't conduct heat as well as say like a nice pressed copper pan that you're gonna see at a nice fresh restaurant, French restaurant or even, you know, a cast iron pan where you get that nice even um, heat distribution. So, making sure that you realize what temperature your fire is at or your coals are at is going to go a long ways to making sure that your oil is nice and hot before you drop the fish in or that grate before you put the steak on is plenty hot um or if you're cooking pancakes and eggs your fire isn't too hot it's a nice medium coal base that isn't going to have flare-ups and create a nicer product so it's just something to really keep in mind um, and that kind of leads into focus and dedication to the meal. So when you're cooking out there and you're using these thinner pots and pans, you can't be walking away from the meal. This is another huge mistake I see and I always encourage people, it's like, if you're the camp cook that night, that's all you need to be doing. If you're, you know, your fuels for your fire are getting low, somebody else needs to be going and gathering more. You need to be focusing on the meal. Um, and that's gonna go a long ways versus trying to start something, going and doing another task, getting pulled off of the meal, and the next thing you know, whatever you're cooking is burnt, or the fire died out and it's just sitting there um, not cooking. So something to keep in mind is that focus and dedication. Um, and then another huge thing when you're preparing these meals is tasting your food as you cook. Um, this is huge. You know, if you're making a soup or you know, I love to make like a paella kind of thing when I'm out there. I, you know, it's horrible to call it a paella, but it's like the most simplistic version of what I could describe what I'm cooking. But it's like, you want to make sure your salt's good. You want to make sure your acid is good. Um, you can't blindly cook a dish and expect it to taste good. You need to be tasting it as you go along. And that kind of leads into flexibility. So a recipe is a guideline it's not a law this is huge you know i mean you're not working for um wolfgang puck making one of his recipes this is someone that's trying to you know direct you down the road to make sure you get where you want to go and you need to you know take it in stride so you know if if you're cooking a dish and it asks for three cups of water and you realize hey this rice is crunchy and I'm out of that that liquid in the pan add some more it's not going to hurt anything um, it's all part of the experience and being flexible is huge so that kind of goes into the next topic that I wanted to talk about here is a notebook this is so underrated and I see this a lot with even people cooking at home is create a notebook dedicated to your meals um, when we're going out in the wilderness, you know, you're lucky to go on a handful of trips a year and you can't catalog every single step that you went through in your brain and look without writing it down and looking back and seeing what happened. You know, if, if you see that, hey, this dish worked or, you know, I struggled playing the fish um, over the backbone here. If you have it written down, you're gonna be able to reference that and see, hey, this is what worked, this didn't work, this dish worked, you know. Um, hey, I, I cooked pancakes and they were burnt on the outside and undercooked on the inside. You know, what was the situation that led to that? And maybe you decide oatmeal is the best course from here on out. So um, it's just a great tool to have and I highly recommend anyone keeping a notebook. And it's fun to read, you know, and especially in February when it's 40 below, and you're looking forward to getting out there paddling and cooking over an open fire and you can be like, well, let's start, let's start menu planning, reference that notebook and be like, oh yeah, that's right. I, I definitely burnt that shore lunch really bad or 
you know, this short lunch turned out really good and this is why. So have that notebook, it'll go a long ways. Um, and that goes into practice, practice, practice. This will encompass everything when it comes to a cooking or any skill set, like, excuse me. It's huge. Um, you can't expect to cook over an open fire three times a year and be a master at it. Um, I, I just think, and same with even dicing vegetables, you know, um, practicing, you know, doing anything with focus and dedication is going to lead to a better result. So an idea I always try to share with people is cook at home over an open fire. You know, if you have a yard and you have a bonfire pit, throw up a grate and try cooking a meal over that versus inside or on the gas grill. Um, it just lets you see where your skill set is and build from there. Um, the other thing to think about is if you're in an apartment building, go to a city park. They have those awesome permanent um, grills out there that are available. Build a fire in it, cook it down, get those coals going, see, see what you can do um, to make that meal mimic how you would make it in the wilderness. And um, it, it, it'll just lead to better meals when you're out there and it's fun. You know, it's something that you can do if you can't get out of town um, and you want to have that experience and then practice, practice, practice goes a long way. So um, great things to think about when trying to create a great meal out there. So the next thing we're going to talk about is equipment and I'm a bit of a minimalist when it comes to this. And the reason is, is that I think, People and myself included, I I'm a known gearhead. I love to have too much gear and not apply it to use as much as I'd like to. And um, it comes down to like kitchen equipment. The essentials they go a long way. They have more than one use. Um, so we can break this down by knives. Knives are huge, and I would recommend everyone get a dedicated kitchen knife, aka chef knife, for their wilderness trips. Um, and this photo I have here in the top left corner, it's a Kiwi brand um, knife. I think it's like a $10 knife on Amazon. It's a knife that a lot of line cooks will use versus their nice, you know, chef knife where, uh, because a lot, cooking on a line, you know, things get banged around and you don't want to have a $270 knife you know, drop on the floor. So this is a great knife to use in the wilderness area. I mean, it's a great universal knife. You can use it at home too. Um, the reason being is it's cheap. It's a non serrated kitchen knife. You know, when you go to a target or whatnot, a lot of those cheap kitchen chef knives have like very fine tooth, um, serrations on it. So you don't have to sharpen it. Well, that, is extremely problematic because when you're cutting into a vegetable or something they tend to go off to one side um, and this is a knife that you can sharpen so it, it it's just as good as like a very expensive chef knife but it's more applicable to using in the wilderness um, I would recommend getting a sharpening stone practicing sharpening on it it's a cheaper steel um, so you can learn to do that. It's very important to have a sharp knife and something that you're not worried about damaging. And this is super applicable to this. Um, the other thing is a fillet knife. Same thing. Go get yourself a Rapala brand fillet knife. They're 12 bucks and they do a great job. Um, it's something you can practice sharpening. It's something you can practice flaying. It's not something you're going to be too invested if it if it falls on a rock and breaks, um, but having the right tool for the job is essential. And, you know, I've seen people go out there and they'll have only had their pocket knife and that's great. It makes food, you know, it, it creates it so that you can, you know, cook it, but it's not going to elevate it to another level where you're going to be like, hey, look at this uniform dice size and how it turns out in the dish. So, Enough of that with talking about knives. I could, once again, these are all subjects I could go on for a long time about. But pots and pans. So right here, you see, see I have a photo. I bought this pan at REI Co-op years ago. 
Um, I can't remember the brand of it, but it's like a 12 inch um, saute pan, high wall rounded, fantastic. It cooks great on a burner or, or a stove, or even like I use it mainly over the open part. You can cook pancakes on it. You can cook um, vegetables in it. You can fry fish in it. It's great. Same here with um, this pot. I think it's GSI or whatnot, enamel. Um, you know, that's great for making stews or soups or boiling water for pasta or rice, whatever you want. Simplistic tools. Um, and then we're going into spoons, tweezers, spatulas, fish spatulas. So um, right here we have, you know, this photo, I have a tweezer, a serving spoon, the knife I talked about, fish spatula, and a spatula. So that right there is going to be able, all the tools you're going to need to get the job done. Um, the tweezers or tongs, I prefer tweezers, and the fish spatula is your other set of hands when you're out there cooking. Um, whether it's turning a product on the grill or, you know, flipping a fish in the pan, it's huge. The reason why I probably go to the tongs or the tweezers more than the tongs is because you can use it for whisking up batter. You can use it for scrambling eggs. Um, it's just a little bit more universal tool and it packs up really nice. Um, the spoon, it's just a serving spoon. You can use it for, you know, mixing up your soup. Um, you can use it for portioning out people's um, dinners, it's just a, a tool that you need, especially tasting as you cook. It's very important to have, and I would recommend having a designated cooking spoon versus using like your spork or your personal spoon, um, just because it's always there with your kit. And then the fish spatula, probably the most universal, universal spatula you can use. Um, the reason being is it doesn't collect grease, um, you can really get a good angle on it. You can f turn pancakes, you can flip a steak. Obviously you can cook fish with it, that's fish spatula. Um, it's a great tool. The one I have here is a longer one. It's probably 12 inches long. It's nice for reaching over the flames. It's a good tool to have. Um, and then you can see in the photo next to that is all four of those, or five of those instruments wrapped up in a hand towel packs up really nice um it's a good way to go and for whatever reason i didn't add hand towels or leather gloves to the list here of essential items hand towels are huge they fill a void where a paper towel won't get the job done um they're your hot pad holders um so whether you're grabbing that pot off the fire or you're wiping out little oil residue in the pan. It's, you just can't underestimate how important a couple good hand towels are. And what I mean by good is thick, um, durable material. They don't need to be anything fancy. Um, you can't see it in the, the photo where I got everything stacked in the pan, but it's a, like a Christmas towel from years ago. Um, and those are two, you know, you just need to have that hand towel out there. It goes a long ways. Um, and then I also recommend leather gloves. Leather gloves are extremely underrated, especially when managing fire or coals, because you can get in there, you can move them without burning your hands. You're not having to use a stick trying to manipulate the coals and, you know, focusing on that. It's just a great thing to have, especially like, once again, you can grab that hot pot off the stove and, um, not burn yourself. So the thing that it's interesting that I put on the list and a lot of people might argue against is a cutting board. Now the reason why I believe in people bringing a cutting board out there with them is it creates a better product. Um, when you have that stable surface to cut on, you're going to be able to have a better dice size. You're going to be able to flay that fish with a little bit more patience, you know, Everyone's heard that you can use a, your canoe paddle and it works great, but then you're dealing with that long handle on the canoe paddle that your person you're camping with might kick while they walk by and vegetables are going flying. Cutting board goes a long ways. It's extremely packable. Um, it fits in 
you know, it's, it's just a really important thing to have. Um, if you go to any kitchen supply store, you can get an NSF um, nylon cutting board. You don't need anything more than like a quarter inch thick. You get the size of a sheet of paper. Um, it will lead to a better experience and a better experience creates better food. So then let's jump into lighting. Um, this is another one of those underrated things. So next to your taste buds, your sense of sight is gonna be the most important thing when it comes to creating a tasty meal. Um, visually, you know, how does that dish look? Or managing during the cooking times, like is that piece of fish, um, you know, browned to the way you want it? Is that steak have the sear on it? You know, is that potato in the tin foil burning in the corner of the, the, the coals. You know, being able to see that's huge. And even if it's July and you're cooking at eight o'clock and the sun's not going down to 10 o'clock, you're at that campsite, there's um, shadows being casted from the trees around there. You're not gonna be able to see it as well. Throw a headlamp on. It, you know, it really surprising how that little extra bit of light is gonna be able to create a, a better quality product need to a tastier dish. So I'd really recommend people cooking with a headlamp on, even if the sun's up. So the other little sneaky thing I have in here is a tote. Um, a tote goes a long way. So if you don't know this, when you're cooking over an open flame, you need to soak the outside of your pots and pans. The reason being is if you don't, that carbon that's coming up from the fire is going to stick itself on the outside of the pots and pans and not want to come off like at all and it's going to make a mess it's going to get everything dirty so if you take a little dish soap and you rub the outside of the pots and pans it makes cleanup a lot easier but as many of you know that doesn't eliminate all the carbon buildup that happens it's still there so having a tote where you can organize and put everything in there is going to keep your pack clean. You know, like the photos I have here in the bottom, this is my Frost River um, Cliff Jacobson pack. Uh, it's one of my favorite packs. It's a day pack and it ends up being like my utility pack on canoe trips. So not only do all my kitchen like cooking supplies go in there, um, you know, my bandsaw goes in there, you know, all the all these a uh, little shovel, whatever sort of random equipment goes in this pack and having all my kitchen equipment in a tote where I can just pull that out of the pack and walk over to my fire, it just keeps things more organized and ends up you know, with a better experience. So the next thing in is patience. This is mindset. This is any sort of wilderness trip you're going on is having the right mindset is gonna lead to a better trip. And when it comes to cooking, it's extremely important to be patient. So what I mean by that is make sure that you're not rushing the dish. If your fire isn't hot enough, build it up until it is hot enough. Don't try to rush it. You know, don't, if your oil in the pan isn't hot enough, don't drop your fish in it. If, the, if your potato isn't fully cooked yet, don't start cooking your protein. Just making sure that you have the patience to realize, hey, we're not at home. Things are gonna take a little bit longer. You know making sure that everything's going in the correct order it's going to go and it's going to lead to a more tasty meal and I, I just can't emphasize that enough patience and dedication and that mindset is probably the most important tool that we have so just keep that in mind um now at the bottom here i have luxury items listed so a stool a table a dutch oven a stool and table pretty self-explanatory you know for me, if I'm sitting there and I'm gonna be tending a fire for a while and cooking a dish for everyone at camp, this is gonna be a maybe a couple hour project and kneeling on a hard rock doesn't really necessarily mean I'm gonna have patience to tend that meal the way I want to. So a stool where I'm comfortable and I'm just enjoying that experience can go a long way. Um, same with the table, you, know, put, you can put your cutting board on it, you know, you can eat around it, Table is a nice thing to have that just leads to an overall better experience. And a better experience is going to always make the food taste better. So keep that in mind. And then 
the Dutch oven, the mythical, magical Dutch oven, um, probably the greatest thing to ever happen to the culinary world when it comes to cooking outdoors. I can't say enough good things about the Dutch oven. I would recommend anyone who doesn't have one, get one, practice with it, learn how to cook with it. You can literally make anything with that Dutch oven. Pizzas, the cinnamon rolls, to cobblers, to curry stew, to, I mean, you name it. I, the, the list goes on and on. It's a great tool. It's really fun to cook with. Um, you can use it at home. You can use it out in the wilderness. Yeah, it weighs a little bit, but what are, you, what are your goals with the trip? You know, do you want to wow the people? Do you want to have this like culinary focused trip? Don't underestimate the power of the Dutch oven. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of the equipment, that's the essentials. And um, let's go to the next slide. So, mise en place. So, to all of you French fluent speakers out there, I am sorry for how I pronounce that. Um, I do the best I can. And what, what it translates to in English language is putting in place or um, set up. So, it's a term that you're going to hear if you spend any time working in a restaurant or uh, watch the Food Network. I'm sure you've heard that term put out there. And it's, it's huge because it's, it can be all-encompassing to where you're talking about, hey, do you have everything you need? Or is it, it could be as granular as having everything portioned up for a recipe and set aside and every ingredient laid out to make sure that you can execute that dish. It's huge. So. When I say mise en place here, I'm going to talk about like the general sense. It's just more, think of it as an idea. Is, do I have my mise en place to create a great um, experience cooking in the wilderness? And this is going to go into menu, grocery list, item list. And it's kind of redundant, but let me explain what I'm trying to get at. So menu, when you go to a restaurant and you look at a menu, really describes everything that's in that dish. So when you're planning out your meal with your friends to go out there, create a menu and don't just say, hey, we're gonna have steak and vegetables. It's like, what are you gonna have with your steak? Are you gonna have a, a garlic butter on your steak? Are you gonna have, you know, what kind of steak? You know, what kind of seasonings do you wanna go with that? What kind of vegetable? How are you gonna cook that vegetable? Be very descriptive because then that's going to lead to a more efficient grocery list. So when you go to the grocery store and you have this menu that you created, you're going to be able to get everything on there and not leave anything out. And that also rolls into an item list. And what I mean by that is making sure that when it comes to time to prepare that meal, you have the item list that was created from the grocery list and the menu so that nothing's left behind. Um, I have been on trips before where uh, after a seven day trip, I look at the bottom of my food bag and there's a, a rotten bunch of cilantro. And I go, totally forgot that I brought that with for taco night and now I wasted it and I get really angry when I waste food. So having that item list goes a long ways to making sure that your meal doesn't end up forgetting something that would have made it taste a little bit better. And that goes with labeling. So, you know, if you're going to have a four day trip, right? Label your meals for night one dinner, night two dinner, night three dinner, or day two breakfast, day three breakfast, day four breakfast. Having those set aside so that when you're digging in your pack, you can grab it. It's going to go a lot easier. Or if, say, you have a, a Nalgene bottle full of buttermilk for pancakes and you're planning on having three days of um, pancakes, make sure that you say that, you know, this is three days worth of buttermilk so that when you're putting that recipe together, when you're using that eyeball for a measurement, you're not um, forgetting something or overusing something. And then the staples to good food. Seasonings, fats, and acids. So. One thing I want to say is don't underestimate the power of good salt and good black pepper. Um, you know, there's a reason why it's on a table at most restaurants you go to. It makes everything taste better and it, you don't need to complicate a dish unnecessarily. 
But if you want to have a little bit more pizzazz to it and you're looking for seasonings, make sure they're fresh. Seasonings have a shelf life. So if, you're, if you have your food pack and you have your seasonings there and you're cycling them from season to season, it's not going to taste good. It, it's going to lose that. You know, you think of like chili powder, paprika, cumin, um, those are really going to lose a lot of their vibrant flavors as they age. And then jumping into fats and acids. So, you know, I would highly recommend that everyone uses a golden olive oil for their universal cooking. Golden olive oil is fantastic for uh, frying fish or, you know, putting on a baked potato if, you, if you're dairy free or seasoning a salad. It's universal. It's, it's a great fat to have and it's um, important. And acid, this is, this is, acid is probably one of the biggest things that separates a home cook to a professional cook and that's using an acid to balance out the fats. Um, it goes a long ways in almost any dish where you're gonna have a fat present and it's just gonna brighten it up, make it overall taste better and something I would recommend. So. You could either you know, transfer vinegar into a plastic container or what I do is I throw a couple limes and a couple lemons in. You know, even in the middle of summer, they'll stay um, you know, shelf stable. It's, it's a very important thing to have. Organization, containers, bags, um, once again, goes a long ways for making sure that your prep's there. You know, talking about like preparing food at home, if, I would recommend anyone cook there. If you're gonna have rice out there, cook it, par cook it at least at home before you bring it. It'll last, especially you know, if, with proper food management. Um, it's going to create a tastier dish. It's gonna ease things up at camp and having the container for that is great. Um, I probably put too many things in Ziploc bags before I go out there. I break it down really individually, but it goes a long ways. And I reuse those Ziploc bags. Ziploc bags, I've really emphasized that people can reuse that, uh, that food bag, take it home, wash it, and use it again. My first um, meal, normally I put my meals in like a two gallon Ziploc bag, I break it up for organization, and that first night Ziploc bag ends up turning into my trash bag for the whole trip. Um, organization goes a long ways. So let's see here. Trip planning. Um, this, this is huge. You know, um, I really think that if you're looking at having the tastier meals in the wilderness, you know, what is your goal of the trip? If, if it is a culinary goal, you know, maybe you should think about, hey, how many miles are we going to cover? If we're going to do a, a four day loop, traditional four day loop, maybe let's do it in five days so that you have a little bit more time at camp so you're not feeling rushed so that you can dedicate that focus to making that meal. It's super important. Um, time of year, I can't stress time of year enough. Shoulder seasons are huge opportunities for cooking great meals. You're not battling with the bugs and your food pack is gonna stay cold and cool for the whole time. As long as you keep it out of the sunlight, it's great. So then you're sitting at the fire, you're not sweating, you're not having the mosquitoes and the black flies bother you, and your food is staying nice and stable in the pack. The shoulder seasons are where it's at. Um, now, talk about location. So talking with like Superior National Forest, they have all these amazing campsites outside of the wilderness area that are wilderness remote campsites where they're easily accessible, you get that same feel, but now you can bring more stuff. Now you can be like, hey, I am bringing that Dutch oven. I am bringing that table. I am bringing those stools. And you can have more of a food-focused trip um, that leads that without worrying about, hey, do I have to do this, you know, 180-rod portage with all this equipment? No, you're, you're having a great time here. Your goal of the trip is cooking that food. Um, and then, of course, I wouldn't be doing my job as community coordinator saying, try grocery shopping up in Northeastern Minnesota after you've traveled up here. So stop at the co-op in Virginia to get your produce. Stop at the co-op in Grand Marais to get your produce. You know, stop at Zoops to get your meats. 
um, spend that money locally. It goes a long ways, and then you end up only having to pack your food once. Um, it, it's, it's awesome. You get to connect with the, the gateway communities that are you know, making sure that our wilderness area is existing. It's super important, so check that out. There's something to think about, too, obviously, is lodging. If you're staying at a bunkhouse the night before you go out, call them up and say, hey, do you have a deep freezer where I can put my frozen foods in? Or I just bought a couple steaks at Zoops and I'd like to freeze them. Can I throw them in a freezer? Having that communication, knowing that your lodging provides that um, is going to lead to like better food storage. So, and of course, dietary restrictions. If you have a friend on your trip that's gluten-free, maybe you shouldn't be planning pancakes for every breakfast. You know, if you have a friend that's vegan, um, what opportunity, what, what are you gonna have there for that traditional first night steak night? Are you gonna have like a marinated portobello mushroom for them? Are they, you know, making sure that everyone's included is extremely important. So um, just keep that in mind. And um, that's, that's about a wrap for the fundamentals to having tastier meals and uh, the B-Dub, uh, thank you all. If you are curious, go check out our website, um, learn more about what the friends are doing. And um, I look forward to answering some questions. Great, thanks Hudson, that was awesome. Um, yeah, that was really so many things that I don't usually consider on my wilderness trip, so that's great. Um, I'm seeing a bunch of comments here in the Q&A and we'll just encourage folks to, to keep adding those as we go through. Um, so that we can make sure we get all of your questions answered. Um, Ken is asking, is there a good portable thermometer to use to check oil temp, especially when cooking fish, um, and what you recommend for that? Boom, check it out. So this is a Lava Tools, it's, a jav it's called the Javelin. Um, it's an instant read digital thermometer. This thing has been put through the ringer. I've had it for years, I haven't had to replace a battery on it. Um, they make them in fun different colors. Highly recommend this product. It goes a long ways, and you can use it for temping your meat, temping your oil. Um, this is definitely the product I would recommend. Great. And then kind of part of that same question, too, Ken was asking the best way to poach fish using a propane stove. Poaching fish. Okay, so that would be, you know, you'd want to have your pan, right? And... What I think people underestimate when poaching a fish is fat with the water. So if you're going to put, you know, a, if your, your goal is poaching a fish, having a little olive oil with the water, having a little acid already in there, you can even season it. And it's as simple as putting it in there, using that spoon that I recommended, basing the hot water on top of that fish, and just waiting for that meat to uh, firm up and start to like separate a little bit is when you're going to really know that your poached fish is ready to go. Perfect. Um, do you have any suggestions for camping recipe books or websites that people should check out? Yes. Um, so that I fast forwarded through the slides, but Dutch oven cooking is an amazing cookbook. It's not being printed anymore, but I think if you Google it on um, and you'll find places, used bookstores they can sell. That one is the Bible when it comes to Dutch oven cooking. And I would really recommend anyone reading that. Other, other than that, you know, this is a problem I've had with people is um, I, <laughs> I'm notorious when, can I get that recipe? And I'm like, I didn't write a recipe. It was just cooking off the cuff. So um, check out that cookbook and maybe that'll lead you to other ones as well. Mm -hmm. um, somebody was wondering too, what are some of your staple entrees for the trail? Like what kind of meals are your go-to? Sure. Um, it, it goes down to what kind of trip um, I want to have. You know, if I'm covering miles and I'm just going to see how, how many lakes I can hit in a trip, I'm going bare bones, um, steel cut oatmeal in the mornings, uh, a tuna pack for lunch, and then dinner will be probably you know, rice and beans. I eat a lot of rice and beans. Um, when I, no matter what trip I go on, I emphasize like maybe only doing one fish meal. You know, it's, it's a resource that we need to respect out there. So it's great to have a fish. You know, we, we buy fishing licenses so fish managers can go out there and do that. 
come. So having at least one fish meal on a trip is great. Um, there's that old adage, I know a lot of people do the frozen steak and they either eat at night one or night two. I, I fall into that as well. Um, but I, I love eating rice and beans. I eat a lot of rice and beans at home. I eat a lot of rice and beans when I'm out there. If you have dietary restrictions, you're hitting gluten-free, dairy-free, vegan. And then um, for meat lovers, you can always throw in a meat with it. So that I would highly recommend rice and beans. That's a great one. Yeah. Um, Janet was wondering if you could talk more about how to prep your pan or your pot before placing it on the fire, saying that they had a mess with the carbon the last time. Sure. Um, I typically go with traditional Dawn dish soap. And what I, what I do is I probably go a little bit more than less. And you take that dish soap, you pour it on the outside of your pan and just you know, like you're waxing a car and you get a nice coating on it. Don't forget the nooks and crannies because that's really where the carbon will stick and nothing's going to be perfect, but I'd say more is better than less. And then when it comes to cleanup time, when you're using your kitchen sink, you know, you're just washing it off, scrubbing it off. Um, and it's, you know, that, that, that should take care of it. So that should get the job done. Great. Uh, another rice and beans question. Barbara wanted to know how you season your rice and beans so they aren't boring. Sure. Um, I So this is where cooking over an open flame incorporates a lot more umami into the dish from that smoke. Um, even a little firebrands coming in there and falling in there is going to add a lot more to the dish versus cooking it on a burner. Um, salt, pepper, I typically bring fresh garlic with me because it's shelf stable and it goes a long way. So get some fresh garlic in there, salt, pepper. Maybe I'll have like, I typically bring some paprika, smoked pap paprika, not just regular paprika, cumin and acid. You know, that's fresh squeezed lemon juice or lime juice is going to really brighten up that dish and bring it on home. So that's, that's my go-to's. Great. Um, Dan was asking if you could say the name of the saute pan that you showed that you used. I was looking beforehand and I, there's no markings on it. So I want to say it's, I can't even tell you. I know I bought it at REI Co-op. Um, and it's the folding it's, you know, I mean, bare bones pan. I wish, I, there's no label on it. So, um, I'm not sure what it is. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Um, we have, let's see, we have a few people asking about veggies. Um, someone asking which ones last a long time and then kind of a similar question. Um, do you recommend dicing and chopping veggies before arriving? And if so, which ones? Sure. Um, well, to answer the beginning part, cabbage, green cabbage or red cabbage, is incredibly shelf stable even in the middle of summertime it can last in your pack without being cooled for a long time onions carrots um if you're going in spring and there's leftover you know storage crops rutabagas parsnips turnips potatoes once again those anything that's like a storage crop will last a long time um and then even like certain green vegetables like Brussels sprouts versus asparagus. Brussels sprouts are gonna last a lot longer versus an asparagus is gonna fall apart. Um, so those are like kind of the vegetables I go with. Kale is another great option. Um, kale is extremely shelf stable and can doesn't need to be cold and adds so much hardiness to a dish. And then I would recommend not cutting them beforehand. The reason being is now you're breaking down sugars, you're breaking down starch, and that's going to lead to that food, you know, not lasting as long. Um, sometimes I will take a potato and I will cook them beforehand, at least par cook them, because then if I'm doing a shore lunch and we want to have fried potatoes, or if I'm thickening up a soup for, you know, because I typically gluten-free, it's great thickener, I'll cook them beforehand, but otherwise, you know, that's part of the experience is dicing that up out there. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. 
I just saw this come in. Um, do you use dehydrated foods? Um, someone is wondering about like the weight savings of that and if that's something that you consider. Sure, yeah. So um, dehydrated beans are probably my go-to um, for dehydrated foods. And, you know, it depends on what, like I said, what kind of trip I'm planning. If I want to go out there and me and, you know, every year I go on a, a trip with some old uh, restaurant friends and it turns into like a competition on who's going to create the best meal out there, you know, the extra weight you're bringing with you on the porridge. Far as food focused. And in that case, um, you know, I might even buy a, a you know, a pre-made dehydrated meal and just use my jet oil to cook it. You know, it's, it's what you want out of your trip. Totally. Um, a few people asked about what type of Dutch oven you use, what brand and size. Sure. Um, I like a 12 quart Dutch oven. It's plenty large. Um, you know, it, it's, even though it's on the larger side, you can still use it for smaller meals. Um, but yet then it's big enough if you have a bigger group. Um, I like to use a Lodge brand. Um, that's probably your best brand that you're gonna be able to buy off the shelf. Make sure the Dutch oven you're getting is an outdoor Dutch oven. So it has a, a rim on the top side of the lid versus and legs versus a Dutch oven that you'd put in your oven at home. Um, that allows you to have the coals underneath and on top. Um, the Holy Grail of Dutch ovens is a Griswold. Um, they're not in production anymore, but if you can find one at an antique store, um, it's really cool and you'll get a lot of like street cred with the Dutch oven lovers out there. Great, well, we're kind of getting towards the end of the time here, um, but just maybe one last question, if you could talk a little bit more about tips for keeping food safe and keeping ingredients cold over a multi-day trip. Sure, yeah. Um, I think that people often overthink this. And what I mean by that is a lot of food is very shelf stable, especially vegetables, especially certain meat products. Um, where you run a little bit of risk is when you're including dairy, but you know, that's pretty much only pertains to like milk, you know, um, butter will last at a, you know, a room temp for infinite amount of time if, you know, not exposed to elements where bacteria can grow on it. Um, and this is kind of where I touch base with like shoulder seasons. If you can go in the spring and the fall, your food's gonna last a lot longer because it's not battling the sun, it's not battling those high temperatures. If you are going in July and that's when your trip is and you want to have a food focused meal, um, think about what foods you can freeze and have frozen going into the trip. You know, I always like to make sure that my pack is stored with the items I need coldest on the bottom because the cold temperature sinks and stuff on the top can be warmer because, you know, that's where the sun's going to be hitting the bag when you're paddling and just having that management. The other thing is, is they make, um, you know, I'll sometimes freeze a water jug and put that in there. I know it's extra weight, but then again, it's like, what kind of trip do you want to have? Um, you can get cooler packs or ice packs that are reusable that will help, you know, make your food last. And then planning your meals. So if you, if you want to have buttermilk pancakes on day one and day two, that's great, but maybe not have them on day six. You know, planning accordingly will go a long way for how you maintain your food in your food pack. Great. Well, that sounds good. This was super helpful. Thanks, Hudson. Um, we are towards the end of our time, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap up here. But I just wanted to thank everybody who attended today, um, and thank you for co coming to Boundary Waters Day. Um, thank you to REI again for kind of working with us on this and for being a partner in this work to educate folks and also to protect the Boundary Waters. Um, Hudson wanted to thank you. This was a great presentation. Um, so I'm really glad that you were on board and, and willing to, to talk with us about kind of some of these tips. Um, for anybody who still has further questions, I'm gonna put my email in the chat. 
Um, and I um, will welcome any questions or any follow-up that you have. Um, this was recorded, so you can watch it probably starting early next week. I will upload it to our Friends of the Boundary Waters YouTube page, um, and that will be a great place for you to rewatch it or send it to others. Um, so I will send out a link to everyone that registered um, to make sure you have that as well. Um, just going to add... That is my email there in the chat, so um, feel free to, to let me know if you have any follow-up questions or anything else. Um, Hudson, any, any final thoughts for all of us? Um, get out there. Have a great time. You know, um, cooking is an experience, and enjoy it and have fun with it. That's, it's one of those beautiful things where no matter what your skill set is, you can approach it and have a good time. So thank you, Maya. I really appreciate it. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Hudson. Have a great weekend.